ಶ್ರೀಹರಿ ಪರಮಂದ ಉಪದೇಷ್ಟೀಶ್ವರ ವ್ಯಾಪಕ ಸರ್ವೋಕ ಕಾರಣ ತಂ ನಮ್ಯಹಂ So we are studying Aparoksha Anubhuti, an introductory text to Advaita Vedanta. A week ago somebody asked me that, um, so this is an introductory text to Advaita Vedanta, so when will you start the real Advaita Vedanta? <laughs> If this is an introduction, so I said uh, to him, don't worry, this is the real Advaita Vedanta. Introductory text is a rough translation of the word Prakarana. prakarana is a simplified introduction to the whole of advaita vedanta some introductory texts deal with a part of some some aspects of the philosophy some introductory texts deal with the entire philosophy in a simplified form so this aparoksha anubhuti it deals with the entirety the essence of advaita vedanta is here so you need not worry that when are we going to get to the real thing this is the real thing of course the root texts the canon the advaita vedanta um, the fundamental foundational texts of advaita vedanta are the upanishads the bhagavad gita and the brahma sutra with their commentaries by shankaracharya so they they are vast they are like an ocean but this is a very good introduction aparoksha anubhuti now we were on verse number 12 we're going to start 13 verse number 12 sets forth the main theme of this book what are the questions that we are seeking to answer in this text the questions are four koham katham idam jatam ko vai kartasya vidyate upadanam kim asti ha vichara swayam idrishah the book has told us that our problems are due to ignorance ignorance about reality and ignorance can only be removed by knowledge so spiritual ignorance is removed by spiritual knowledge now knowledge comes from a process of what is called vichara philosophical inquiry or spiritual inquiry in india philosophical inquiry and spiritual inquiry are not two different things the word for philosophy in india is darshana even now if you go to an indian university and you want to go to the philosophy department you will see darshan that is the name of the department darshan literally means seeing an insight understanding so philosophical inquiry or spiritual inquiry whichever way you put it that will lead to spiritual knowledge and it will remove ignorance now for inquiry we need questions what are the questions we are going to inquire about we are going to inquire about reality we do not know reality that is the claim of vedanta so in order to know reality we must question we must ask questions about reality what are these questions first and foremost we must start from where we are who are who are we who am i the first question must be an inquiry into the self after all it is the self which is inquiring i am inquiring so let's begin by knowing who i am really that's one question second question is what is all this the world in front of me the objective universe which confronts the subject what is the nature of all this how does this come about that's the second question third question is what is the cause of all of this you see the, these are the three great themes of vedanta of any philosophy in fact the self individual the world and god the ultimate reality god brahman whatever you call it so the questions are about three things when you ask about questions about reality we are asking about the reality of three things one is the individual i myself or we each of us who are we second about the world and third about the cause of this world 
because religion tells us there is a there is God, science tells us there is some material cause, natural cause behind this universe. We would like to know. Here, the question about the cause of the universe is divided into two questions. Asking a question about Brahman or God is divided into two questions. One question is about the material cause, another question about the efficient cause. What do you mean by material cause and efficient cause? In a, in a very simple way, material cause is the substance, say the wood out of which this table is made is called the material cause of the wood, the stuff. What is the stuff of this universe? So in science you would want to know is it super strings or is it some uh, uh, subnuclear particles? So what is the stuff of this universe? That's one question. This is called upadana karana, the material cause. And the second question was about the intelligence or the, the efficient cause, like a, a carpenter made this table out of wood. If wood is the material cause of this table, the carpenter would be called the efficient cause. In that sense, is there an intelligence behind this universe, which religion calls God? So these are the two questions. It's one question. It's actually a question about God, but it's divided into two. One is a question about the material, the reality, the stuff of this universe. The other is about the intelligence behind this universe. So, question about Brahman, question about Jagat, question about Jiva. These are, it's good to know these terms. Brahman, the ultimate reality. Jagat, the universe. Jiva, that's you or me, the individual. Questions about these three. Now, we shall begin. The rest of the book will be an attempt to answer these questions and having ascertained the answer to these questions to make it a living reality, to actually experience this for oneself. There will be practices afterwards. And finally it will conclude with the results of such practices. What happens when you become enlightened? So that's what's going to happen in the book. Before they get into the details, it is the style of these ancient authors when they ask a question, they'll give you the answer in brief. When you ask a question, you first get the answer in brief, maybe in, a, in one verse or half a verse, and then they'll go into details. So, four questions, and the answers to those four questions will come in the next three verses, and then we'll get into the details. So, they will not keep us waiting till the end of the year for the answers to, say, question number three or question number four. All the questions will be answered today and then explained in detail for the rest of the year. You know, it is said in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks a question and Krishna teaches Arjuna and whatever Krishna wants to teach has been taught in the second chapter. But there are 18 chapters. Why did he teach 16 more chapters? Well, just because Arjuna asks questions and he has doubts about this or that, and so there are details. Sixteen chapters are detailed. Whatever Krishna wanted to say has been, in a sense, said in the second chapter. Now we shall come to verse number 13. Naham bhuta gano deho Naham bhuta gano deho Naham chaksha ganastatha Naham chaksha ganastatha Etad vilakshana kashchid Etad vilakshana kashchid Vichara soyam idrishaha Vichara soyam idrishaha Verse number 13 the answers to those four questions. Who am I? What is this universe? And what is the ultimate reality? Material cause, efficient cause. It starts with an answer to this first question. Who am I really? Vedanta says, right away we make a big mistake. We think we are this body-mind system. And we have no doubts about it. Vedanta wants to create a doubt in our minds. Are we really this body-mind system? Are we limited to an individual, this body of flesh and blood and the psyche behind this body? That's what we think we are. Vedanta assures us we are not that, we are mistaken. So it starts there. Naham bhuta gano deho, naham chakshaganastatha. 
I am neither the body, nor the sense organs, nor the mind. Edad vilakshana, something other than this, something quite different from this am I. Vichara soya midrisha, this is the line of spiritual inquiry. Let's con consider this. First he says, Naham bhuta gano deha. This book was written by Shankaracharya about 1400 years ago. 700 years after Shankaracharya lived a great philosopher and spiritual master Vidyaranya in the south of India who wrote the Panchadashi, a classic book of Advaita Vedanta. He has also written a commentary to this text, to the Aparokshanubhuti. Vidyaranya has written a beautiful commentary in Sanskrit to this text. And so he explains. I'll often use his commentary to explain. I'll be basing my explanations on his commentary mostly. So here he says, this is the view of the materialist. He says, Charvaka, Brihaspati Matam. Charvaka, Charvaka, the ancient Indian materialists. And what is their view? Who am I? The Charvaka, the materialist says, I am a mixture of the elements. This body, a mixture of five elements, space and air and fire and water and earth. Or a modern physiologist might tell you, dozens of different elements from the periodic table, they go to make this body. So in any case, the materialist says, the ancient or the modern, both of them say, this body which is a combination of different elements, that's what we are. We say that, but we are conscious, we are not just material things. And they say, well, consciousness emerges from an interaction of materials in this body. Life emerges and consciousness emerges. Consciousness and life are emergent phenomena. That's the view of the materialist. And that's the view of the latest theories also in more mainstream science. So it's life and consciousness are emergent phenomena. They are, we are basically matter. As a scientist said, what are we? We are food rearranged. Food on your plate rearranged becomes this body. So, the materialist point of view is we are a mass of matter. But Vedanta says we are not that. You see, the whole problem is when I sit in this body of matter, flesh and blood and bone and, and all sorts of gooey substances, I sit in the middle of that and I say, I am suffering. I identify myself with this. I am this. The Vedantin tells us the root of suffering, one great cause of suffering, is to say, what does not belong to me if I claim it? If it is not mine and I claim it is mine, then I am, I am signing up for lots of suffering. You see, when do we claim something is ours? This body, we claim it is ours. It's made of matter. When do we claim something is ours? Well, for example, if you, if you own the material out of which something is made, you can claim it's mine sometimes. I have bread, I make toast and I say it's my toast. Why? Because the bread is mine. Well, is this matter, the five elements, are they mine? How are they mine? Space, earth fire, water, all the dozens and dozens of elements in a periodic table. How can I ever claim they are mine? Who gave them to me? There's this joke about a scientist who went to God and said, well God, I have created life in my laboratory. Uh, so what, what great thing have you done? I've also created life in my laboratory. And God says, uh, really, show me. And he takes God to the laboratory and he says, well, this is how I do it. First, I take some earth and God said, get your own earth. <laughs> <laughs> do you own the material? The atoms and protons and uh, the, the, the electrons and neutrons and subatomic particles, do I own that? No. I didn't create it. I don't own it. Did somebody give it to me as a gift? Not that I recall. Did I buy it in the supermarket? No. Did I make it? All our effort is we pick up the food and put it in our mouths. And the rest of it is done by nature. Manufacturing this body of flesh and blood out of, out of food, it's done by nature. I don't make it. 
I don't have the know-how, I wouldn't have the capa capacity to do it. If it was up to me, the body would die within, within a day or two probably. <laughs> right? So, something else is running it. How can I say that, that it's mine if I have not made it? Nobody has given it to me in a gift. I did not buy it. I don't own the materials out of which it is made. I didn't win it in the lottery. I didn't inherit it. Not, a rich uncle didn't die and leave me a body. So, we don't own the material. And we have no right to say that this body, it's mine, or I am this body. Vidyarinya gives a philosophical reason. He says, Ghatatvena drishtavat. He says that just like, um, like a pot, when you see a pot, or this microphone, it's an object of my knowledge. I am the one which knows it. I am the drashta, this is the drishya. He says, Ghatavat drishyatvena. Just like a pot, it is experienced. That which is experienced is an object. I am the experiencer apart from it. So these two terms, it is good to know. Drashta and Drishya in Sanskrit. In Vedanta again and again we will use this. Drashta means the seer, the experiencer. Drishya means that which is seen, the experienced. So this microphone is Drishya, I am the Drashta. Everything that I experience in the world outside is Drishya. I am the drashta. And Vedanta tells us this body, is it drish, drashta or drishya? Is it the seer or the seen? We think that I am the seer here. This is, this is the seer and this is the seen. But actually this body is also the seen. Isn't it experienced? I can see this body. I can touch this body. I can feel it. All of it I can experience. I am the experiencer of the body. Hence I cannot be the body. The material body is an object of experience. I am the experiencer. Let's go deeper. Then the material, materialist takes one step back and he says, well, if you are not the physical body, you are experiencing through the sense organs and through the mind. So why not say that you are the mind and sense organs and you are embodied, you are in the body. That's also a materialistic point of view a more sophisticated, subtler materialistic point of view, where he says, you are the sensory system, mind and sensory system. He says, Aksha Ganaha. Aksha means I, Gana means group, the group of senses. You can say that I am the group of senses with the mind which experiences the body. But the same problem applies there. The sense organs are also objects of experience. It is true that with my eyes I experience the the microphone, I can see you all. But the eyes themselves are objects of my experience. Do I not know my eyes are open? Do I not know my, I need glasses? I know the conditions of my eyes. I know the conditions of my sense organs. Even my mind, which I am using to understand the world, I know what's happening in the mind. If I just sit quietly and look inside, I am happy, I am sad, I remember, I forget, I understand. I do not understand. Everything that goes on in the mind is revealed to me as an object, though a subtle object. They are not gross objects like things outside, but the mind is a subtle object. Being an object, it cannot be me the subject. Being drishya, it cannot be drashta. Drishya, object, that which is experienced. Drashta, subject, the experiencer. I clearly experience myself as the experiencer, and the mind as something experienced. You see, the confusion arises because when I use the mind and the sense organs to look at the world outside, then I include the mind within the subject. That's why I get the feeling that the mind is the subject. It's the, you see, often when we use an instrument, I'm using a pen for writing or a, a, a shovel for gardening, and I become so one with the instrument, or you are playing tennis with a racket, you become so one with the instrument, it seems to be part of you. But it's not part of you. It's something that you have taken up for use. Exactly in the same way, the consciousness which we are, takes up the mind and the sense organs and the body, and then uses it as instruments to experience the world. But it can just as well step back, figuratively speaking, it can step back, and see that the mind and the body and the sense organs are as much objects as this or this. 
So, naham makshaganas tatha. I am not this sensory system or the mind either. Etad vilakshanaha kashchit. I am something very... Vilakshana is different. I am something very different from this. And Vidyaranya points out Viparitagam. Of a different nature. All these are objects, things. You see, it's strange to call the mind a thing. We are so used to thinking of the mind as myself. But this, as the table is a thing, the body is also a thing. An experienced object. The mind is also a thing in that sense. But I myself am not a thing. This is Etad Bilakshan. I am something very different from all of this. All of what? The body and the mind. Body, sense organs and mind. I am something very different from all of this. And it's not explained in detail. It will be explained later. These are objects. I am the subject. These are the known, I am the knower. These are insentient, I am sentience itself, consciousness itself. These are changing, I am unchanging. These are uh, many, I am one. In all these ways, I am different from all of this. Etad vilakshana, kashchit. The Sanskrit word is something. I am something. Quite different from all of it. Why did he use the word something? Why did he not say I am the Atman, Brahman, uh, consciousness, the, the, the clear light of the void or whatever, or God or something. He says, no. He uses a word, a vague term, something. I'm something different from all of this. The commentator Vidyaranya says here, he does this on purpose. The author has done this on purpose. Because what I am in reality cannot be expressed in language. He uses this word to indicate what I am in reality, what you are in reality. It cannot be expressed in thought or language. You are beyond all conceptualization and expression in language. He says, Shabda pravritti nimitta nimitta rahitatvat. Jati adi shabda pravritti nimitta rahitatvat. Some such language. All the things which we can use to... to uh, all the things which can which enable us to use language it's a very philosophical term he has used all the things which enable us to use language are absent in the reality which I am if you want details of this I refer you to my lecture the paradox of language Advaita Vedanta and the paradox of language I think it's been uploaded to the YouTube you see we say the ultimate reality Brahman or I myself the Atman it is beyond words and beyond language. It cannot be expressed in language. But we can ask, why not? It's a worthwhile question asking, why can it not be expressed in language? To understand why it cannot be expressed in language, you need at least one hour to, ex to <laughs> explain this. But it's a worthwhile inquiry. Do look up the, the um, lecture which is titled Advaita Vedanta and the Paradox of Language. It's on YouTube. He just indicates it here just by one word. Kashchit. Something. Why something? Because it's beyond language. Vichara Soyamitrisha. This is the line of spiritual inquiry. This is the line of spiritual inquiry. He will pick up this theme after three verses. In the next class we'll pick it up again. Who am I? Why I am not the body? Why am I not the mind? What am I really? How can I understand the fact that I am not the body? We have so many questions. If I am not this body but I still feel the pain in this body, it will be a first question many people ask. So how can I understand this? How can I make it a living reality? That will be a long discussion on this. And the author will try to give us a spiritual insight into why I am not the body or the mind. Why I am the witness pure consciousness. That will go on for a long time. And very detailed investigation, beautiful and powerful investigation. Verse after verse, reason after reason. I remember there will be a verse, in one verse he will give us seven reasons, seven ways of understanding why I am not the mind. And each of them is remarkable. So all those will come later on. But here he has just briefly indicated 
I am not the body and mind. I am something quite different from the body and mind. That's all. A very senior monk in uh, Belurmat told me this, that uh, it is true that whether God exists, what, kind, what is God exactly, how am I, Brahman, all these things I may, may not have realized it yet. But one thing I know for certain, one thing I know for certain, there is something beyond this objective universe, beyond this objective body and mind. This, you see the same word again, kashchit. He says, now he said it in such a way which is clearly admitting that he had realized that, that it's a, it's a clear instinctive feeling, intuitive feeling for him. He knows it clearly. So that something is there. First question, who am I? Up to this. This much. For now. Now let's go on quickly to the next question. All this I find myself in the midst of. Here I am in a body, here are other people, here is a family, here are obligations, here are desires in the mind, here are things to do, here are joys to taste, here are miseries to avoid, and here is a whole world in front of me, good, bad, ugly, whatever. This is samsara, this is called samsara. How does this come about? That's the question. When Swami in the Himalayas, he writes beautifully, is he was in a little village in the north of India before he became a monk. He was a young boy on the bank of the Ganges. And he, was, he would go, whenever he heard some Swami has come, wandering monk, he would go and ask him about God and the self and realization and enlightenment. So once this very strange monk came along who, uh, who stayed under a tree on the bank of the Ganges. And this Swami, who was a young boy at that time, he said he went and asked him his usual question. Oh, holy sir, Please teach me spiritual practice. Sadhana bataye. Please teach me spiritual practice. And the monk snapped at him. Don't do anything. What? Don't do anything. Can you do that? What do you mean don't do anything? And then the monk said, Without doing anything, all this is in front of you. The more you do, the more it will increase. Without doing anything. You never signed up for this. Did you ever, uh, do you remember signing, filling up a form, I want to be born with such and such parents in this place and I want to have these experiences? No. It's come without any effort on your part, all this is in front of you. And the monk said, the more you do, the more it will keep on increasing. You can, you'll never get out of it if you do something. So can you do nothing? And the boy replied, so wisely for a little boy. No, I cannot do nothing. Then the monk said, okay, here are this whole range of spiritual practices, prayer and meditation and scriptural reading and service and so on and so forth. Anyhow, this entire universe appears in front of us. How? Answer. Verse number 14. Ajjana prabhavam sarvam Ajjana prabhavam sarvam Jnana praviliyate Jnana praviliyate Sankalpo vividha karta Sankalpo vividha karta Vichara soya mitrishaha Vichara soya mitrishaha What does this mean? Answer to question number two. How does this samsara come about? The answer in Advaita Vedanta is straight and very interesting. If you ask a scientist, how does it come about? Oh, he'll tell you about the Big Bang and the creation of matter and energy and space and time and so on. If you ask a man of religion, how does this come about? Oh, God created all this. And there are different philosophies in Indian philosophy. They have got different answers for them. Sankhya says that Prakriti created all this. Purva Mimamsa says all of this is caused by karma. Karma and karma fala and so on. What does Advaita Vedanta say? What is the Vedanta answer to all of this? Why is all this in front of us now? And the answer is, Agyana Prabhavam is born of ignorance. It's born of ignorance. It's born of not knowing. What do you mean? How can something be born of not knowing? It's exactly like 
there is a rope in the semi-darkness. We do not know the rope as a rope. We see something and the next moment we imagine a snake. That snake is born of my ignorance of the rope. I'll repeat that. The snake seen in error, the rope mistaken for a snake, that snake is born of ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of the rope. Ignorance of the reality. And Advaita says something radical. This is that our entire samsara experience, I'm using the words very carefully. Our entire samsara experience at this moment, unless you are enlightened, our entire samsara experience at this moment is born of ignorance of the reality, the reality being Brahman. There is a reality here. We do not know it as it is. And hence we make a mistake about it. And what, what is the mistake, result of that mistake? The result of that mistake is space and time and causation and a world of names and forms and multiplicity and division. A world of change, a world of birth and growth and decay and death. A world of seeking happiness and finding unhappiness. A world of life after life experiencing this changing world. This samsara is created by just one thing, not knowing the reality as it is. That's the claim of Advaita Vedanta. Don't worry, they will substantiate it later on. They will show us how to understand this. Now, two points. Anything that is created by ignorance is false. Think about it. Nothing real comes out of ignorance. Whatever we, we know through ignorance, we call it a mistake, we call it an error, we call it a dream. The snake which we see through ignorance of the rope is, a, is false, it's not a real snake. The water we see in the desert by not knowing that it's a mirage, we, see, we think it's real water, it looks like water. But it's no real water at all, it's, it's just the desert. The blue color we see at day daytime in the sky, it looks blue, the sky seems blue, but it's the sky itself is not blue. It's just an illusion created by the scattering of light in a particular way. So that which appears because of ignorance is false. The second point is, that which is false, it does not mean it will not be experienced. What is the difference, what is the meaning of something which is false? That which is false is something which does not exist and yet it appears. Let me repeat that. The false is that which does not exist yet it appears. The snake does not exist there, there in the rope. It appears. The water is not there in that desert that, that looks like an oasis. It's not there but it appears. The blueness is not in the sky, it appears. In the same way, samsara is not there in reality, it appears in Brahman. Due to ignorance of the rope, we see a snake. Due to ignorance of the desert, we see a mirage water, the water, we don't know it's a mirage. Due to ignorance of Brahman, we have samsara, this, this experience of the universe which we are having, what we call life. So, two points I've made. That what is, what is produced by ignorance is false. And false does not mean we will not experience it. We will experience it. So what we have to do is to recognize the reality. Then, then the false will be exposed as false. We will still continue to experience it. Like a person who sees water in the desert, in, in the mirage, thinks it's real water, goes there and fi finds out it's a mirage, walks away. When he looks back again, what does he see? Does he see a desert? He sees water again. But now he knows it's false. He knows it's an appearance. It's not really there. In the same way, before enlightenment, we see this universe out there. We see this body, mind inside, and the universe outside. And that's what we consider life to be. After enlightenment, we will still continue to see the same thing. Only we will realize it's an appearance and infinite existence, consciousness, bliss. <coughs> or in other words, God alone, Brahman alone is the reality. Reality out there, reality in here. Out there and in here is only because of the body. So, 
That's the point. Now the question is, how do we know? How does it happen? How do we get enlightenment? And the answer he gives is, Jnane na praviliyate. All ignorance is dispelled by only one thing, knowledge. Every kind of ignorance is dispelled by knowledge. So, knowledge will remove ignorance. If our problem is ignorance, then the solution will be knowledge. Now here is one thing to understand. Simple point. Which knowledge will remove which ignorance? Knowledge will remove ignorance if only, the English words would be, the locus and object of the knowledge and ignorance are the same. Don't worry, I'll explain. It's a fancy way of saying something very simple. In Sanskrit it is called Ashraya and Vishaya. Jnana and Ajnana, knowledge and ignorance, must have the same uh, locus and object in order, to, in order for knowledge to remove ignorance. What does this mean? Something very simple. Suppose I do not know physics. So I have ignorance. Where is the ignorance? In my mind. About what is this ignorance? Physics. Now what will remove this ignorance? Knowledge. But what knowledge? Not knowledge of biology or Sanskrit or, or, or Veda or even Vedanta. Rather it, it should be knowledge about what I am ignorant of, physics. And where should this knowledge come? Where there is ignorance. The knowledge in the mind of the professor of physics in UCLA will not remove my ignorance. The knowledge in the book of physics will not remove my ignorance. Only the knowledge which is generated in my mind, where there is ignorance, in the same locus, that knowledge will remove ignorance. And the knowledge has to be about the same thing about which I am ignorant. It's, as you can see, it's a fancy way of saying something very simple. Knowledge and ignorance must have the same object and same locus. So, jnane na praviliyate. Ignorance disappears when knowledge arises. And the commentator says, just like darkness disappears when light is, when you light it up. And Sri Ramakrishna says something very um, inspiring. He says, the darkness, a, a room dark for a thousand years. A room dark for a thousand years. Remember, something like a, the pyramids when they were first rediscovered again. Maybe after two, three thousand years. And when they went inside and opened, so that the rooms inside, the chambers inside were dark for 30 centuries, 40 centuries. And when the first torch was lit there, the darkness accumulated for 4,000 years or 3,000 years disappeared in a flash. Don't say in 40 years or 100 years. Moment you light, you, you bring in light, darkness disappears. It may be the darkness accumulated throughout a lifetime, throughout many, many lifetimes. Sri Ramakrishna says, strike a match, light, bring in light, and the darkness of a thousand years disappears in a flash. In the same way, jnane na praviliyate, darkness, ignorance dissolves, disappears when knowledge arises. But remember, not my guru's knowledge, not Ramakrishna's knowledge or Vivekananda's knowledge. It must be your own knowledge. It must be my own knowledge, the knowledge generated in my mind. And it must be about, the knowledge must be about Brahman. Because my ignorance is about Brahman. Or about my own self. So this is an answer to the second question, a very interesting answer. What is the nature of this world? How does it arise? It arises because of ignorance. We do not know the reality which is God or Brahman or existence, consciousness, bliss. We do not know that and hence we see this world. That which is immortal, we see as mortal. That which is pure consciousness, we see as a material universe. That which is unchanging, we see as com continuously changing. That which is all bliss, we see as all suffering. The Buddha said, Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. Suffering, suffering, all is indeed suffering. Where? In the samsara which we experience. It's very interesting. Nagarjuna, the great philosopher who, who uh, is the source of Shunyavada, the, the philosophy of the void, one of the fundamental philosophical tenets of Mahayana Buddhism. 
in his mula madhyamaka karika nagarjuna says there is not the slightest difference between samsara and nirvana what a shocking statement i want enlightenment and nirvana and he say and this is samsara i want escape from this samsara i want to be enlightened and he says there is not the slightest di- difference between what you see here and nirvana it's exactly like saying there is not the slightest difference between the snake and the rope because what you perceive in by error as the snake is indeed the rope what we perceive as the world is in reality in enlightenment upon enlightenment is god where here when now in what in everything that is what vedanta is trying to tell us now the answer to the third question what is the nature of god which creates this universe the cause of this universe brahman now this is a little complicated let me just give it to you uh, in brief first what he is trying to say here the standard texts of advaita vedanta the post shankara texts when you ask them what is the nature of the creator what is the efficient cause and what is the material cause i hope you remember what is efficient cause and material cause efficient cause is something like the carpenter who made the table material cause is the wood out of which he made the table what is the material of this universe and what intelligence created this universe standard post shankara advaita texts will give you answer in this way they will say vedanta sar for example they will say saguna brahman brahman with the power of maya is called god or ishwar or bhagavan and the brahman the consciousness aspect of it because in brahman in saguna brahman there are two aspects one is satchidananda consciousness the other one is the power of maya the consciousness aspect of it is the efficient cause and the maya aspect of it is the material cause the consciousness aspect the nimitta karana efficient cause the maya is the upadana karana is maya itself is transformed into this universe so maya is the upadana karana or material cause that's the standard answer and the example they gave is uh, from the mundaka upanishad yathornanabhi srijate grinhate cha as a spider from its own body produces a web similarly god so now you, from now on you look up on spiders more kindly spiders are compared to god there is an indologist who wrote this book about the religious beliefs of the ancient hindus and he said the ancient hindus worshiped a huge spider no they did not it's an example the upanishad clearly says just like yatha as now why is the spider example a good example because the spider is a living being there's a living being there and also out of its own body it does not take material from outside from its own body it spins a web in the same way so so here the spider the living entity is the efficient cause and its own body is the material cause let me repeat that a carpenter is something different from the wood carpenter comes he takes wood from outside and makes a table but where will god get anything different from himself to make a universe there is nothing apart from god god is the only reality swami vivekananda tells a joke was about um when he came here in the late 19th century there was this country preacher talking about the creation of the universe of, of the world and he says well god created the world and he hung it out on the fence to dry and somebody asks in the congregation but father where did he get the fence and the preacher gets wild you keep quiet you're going to spoil all the theology you're going to ruin the theology if you ask such questions <laughs> there is nothing apart from god so where does god get the material to create this universe it must be from within god god's own substance own reality so maya is taken as the reality is the substance out of which god creates this universe that's the standard answer but here shankaracharya takes a different route what he is going to say here sankalpo vividho karta vichara soyam itrisha 
Just these two words, sankalpa vivida katta, three words, they'll create a lot of difficulty. See, what he's saying here is this. God or Ishwara, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with Maya. Let me use the word God, simple. God and us, individual, jiva, together we are responsible for this universe. We are the efficient cause together. How so? See, in the traditional answer, God creates this universe. You can still ask why. Why? Somerset Maam, when he's writing about the, the Vedanta philosophy in his book, uh, no, not in the book Razor's Edge, in another place he's writing. Well, the Hindus say that God created this universe out of his own power, like a spider spins a web. And then Somerset Mount Mom comments, I feel he could have left it well enough alone. He shouldn't have created it. Put us in a lot of trouble. So you can ask, why did God create this universe? And the answer that the Vedantins give is, we have, a, we individuals, we have a lot of karma. We have done many things and we will get the results of those things. Good things, good results. Bad things, naughty things, bad results. But we need to get those results. Every cause will have its effect. In order to get the results of our actions, we need a universe. And we need bodies. We need experiences. It's like children who want to play. So the parents provide them with a playground and balls and bats and, and you know, playmates and everything. So we need this experience and God provides us this experience. Why do we have the results of karma? Because we have done karma. Why have we done karma? Because we have desire. Why do we have desire? Here is the crux. Because of our thinking. Sankalpa is thinking and not any kind of thinking. Thinking that something is nice and I want it. I am confronted with this world. So far so good. Now I immediately think I am a little body and mind. I need clothes, I need food, I need power and prestige and money and pleasure. Why? They are all nice. This thinking, this is called sankalpa. This sankalpa leads to desire called karma. Desire, karma. And desire leads to action called karma. Karma leads to the results of actions. And that's where God comes in and gives us this universe. So now what he is saying here is, he is putting it very cryptically. Sankalpo vividho karta. Our thinking, the sankalpa, the varieties of sankalpa are the efficient cause of the universe. But there is a lot of complexity behind this, these three little words. He is putting us into a lot of, he is ruining the theology by putting in the, these three words. It's a very, lot of sophisticated thinking has gone into it. But to put it briefly, God creates this universe in order to give us an opportunity to experience the results of our karma. Why do we have results of our karma? Because we have done karma in this life or past life. Why have we done karma? Because we had desire, karma. Why did we have desire? Because of sankalpa, thinking that I want this and that. If you ask why did we have such thoughts, that goes back to ignorance. We do not know that we are Brahman. It's only the enlightened who know themselves as existence, consciousness, bliss as Brahman, who will not have that kind of thinking that I want this or I want that. So this is the link. Sankalpa vividha karta. If you have questions about this, we'll take it up after we finish. Um, in fact, let me do one more verse and then we can stop. Verse number 15. Etayor yadupadanam, Etayor yadupadanam, Ekam sukshmam sadabhyayam, Ekam sukshmam sadabhyayam, Yateva mridghata dinam, Yateva mridghata dinam, Vichara soyam idrishaha. Vichara soyam idrishaha. 
of these two, eta yo, which two? Ignorance and the result sankalpa. Sankalpa, thinking. Ignorance about our real nature and thinking that I want this or I want that. And from which all the mischief comes. Thinking like that leads to desire. Desire leads to action. Action leads to result of the action. And God immediately generates this Disneyland for us to play around. And that's our samsara. Now, this thinking and its cause, ignorance. What is the root of that? Where are they? And the answer is, they are all in one reality, ekam. What is that reality? Sad avyayam. In the infinite existence, consciousness, bliss, which is Brahman. In that, this ignorance and these thoughts, they are appearing. The reality ultimately behind everything is Brahman. Upadanam, there's one concept we should understand. Upadanam, the material cause. How do you know the material cause? It's a very subtle concept and very beautiful concept. In anything, how do you know the material cause? That which gives something its existence is the material cause of that. What gives existence to this table? Wood. So wood is the material cause of this table. What gives existence to the big wave you see in the Pacific Ocean out there? Water. Water is the material cause of that wave. What gives existence to the ornament? Gold, if it's a golden ornament. Because without that, the ornament wouldn't exist. So, gold is the material cause. What is the material cause of this universe? And the answer Vedanta gives is something very interesting. It says, Sat, existence itself. You see, wherever we do, any experience we have, we have one experience, common to everything. It is. It is being. It exists. Don't you feel all around you that we are sitting in an ocean of existence? I exist and everything exists around it. And we never give attention to that existence itself. Advaita says you, should, you are missing the most important factor in life, in all our experience. It is existence. And existence in itself is Brahman. So, Sad Abhyayam. Abhyayam unchanging. Our experience about ourselves is that we are changing. The, the Shastras talk about six kinds of changes. Um, jayate, birth or creation, coming into existence, asti. Then growth, vardhate. Then maturity, viparinamate. Then decay or old age, apakshiyate. Uh, and then nashyati, destroyed, death. Sixfold changes. And Abhyayam means which does not have these sixfold changes. Pure being, existence, Brahman is not subject to these sixfold changes. That is the ultimate material out of which the universe is made. So the, the question was, what is the material cause of this universe? It is Brahman. What is the reality of this universe? It is Brahman. Example, Yateva Mrid Ghatadinam. Just like a clay pot. You can answer this question now. If the material cause of something is that which gives existence to it, what is the material cause of a clay pot? Clay, because it gives existence to the pot. Exactly in the same way, this entire universe, the material cause here is Brahman, Sat or pure being. That is the uh, example given here. And he says, Vichara Soyam Idrisha. This is the line of philosophical or spiritual inquiry which will be undertaken. So now we have got the answers to the four questions. Who am I? You are Brahman. What is this universe? It is false, born of ignorance. Ignorance of what? Of Brahman. What is the cause of this universe? Material cause and, and uh, efficient cause. In one word, it is Brahman. So, the formulation, what does Advaita Vedanta teach? Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahma Napara. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance or false. And you the individual, you are none other than Brahman. By error you think of yourself as an individual being. You are that infinite existence consciousness bliss. That's what he has said. That's, these are the answers which go to make up that formulation. Brahman is real. World is an appearance. You are Brahman. Alright. Um, let me give... Shanti Mantra, then we can take a couple of questions.
शांति 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 हरि ओ तत्सत्ष्णारूपण questions yes there is a question here so you were explaining that the genesis of the world comes from uh, a need to work out karma and i'm wondering how did the transactional difference between the individual jivas and ishvara arise yeah. uh, in the first place yeah so this question is inevitable when you say why is this world there the root cause is of course ignorance we do not know we are brahman but even that is not a complete answer it's true that we do not know brahman but we have this variety of the world your life is different my life is different and the world is built on a particular pattern so what explains all of this and the answer is karma our our different karma and god provides us with different experiences because of our karma now where did we get all this karma past life and why did the past life come because of the karma before that and you see with the way the question will lead to that okay so how did it all start and that's the question he's asking how did this chain of karma start the answer is it did not start the real answer is it's not there reality only brahman is there but if you take it for granted that it is there if you assume that then you can ask how did it start and then advaita will tell you anadi beginningless you are evading the answer it seems that it should have a beginning no in fact all ignorance is beginningless think about it anything based upon ignorance is beginningless if i if you are dreaming example if you are dreaming and a lion is chasing you and somebody comes to you and say that it's a dream there's no real lion it's based upon your ignorance you you don't know you're just on on the bed lying down and dreaming and you don't accept it then that person says okay there is a real lion you just go up climb this tree and stay there until day break and the lion will go away and if you climb the tree and ask how did this lion come where is the where is the dad and the mom of this lion and how did how did they come there's no end to that because actually the lion is not there let me give an even simpler example to show that any ignorance is beginningless if i ask you um do you know oriya a language in in india do you know oriya if i ask you most of you will say that no i don't know that language and i haven't even heard of it maybe i don't know that language and if i ask you since when do you not know this language <laughs> you say oh or from my birth oh so you knew oriya before your birth No you didn't. In fact your ignorance of oriya and ignorance of anything that you're ignorant about is beginningless. But it has an end. The moment you start learning oriya your ignorance about oriya is beginning to fade. So knowledge ends ignorance. Ignorance is beginningless but has an end. When knowledge comes ignorance ends. So ignorance is beginningless and the the parallel no jiva and ishwara god and man and the karma and the cycle of creation in that sense it is beginningless so you should not ask how it did it start yeah the answer will be number 1 it did not start but if that's not palatable right now then the answer will be it is without a start yes there's a question Swami, so so are we saying that all of the majesty of the order and multiplicity of whether it's flowers, planets, Niagara Falls, that's all ignorance and not real? None of it. That I mean, how could our little imagination? I mean, I'm just I understand. so confused. Two questions here. <laughs> all this tremendous variety and order in the universe which we see. natural beauty science and so all of that is it real or not is it all false number 1 number 2 is are we imagining it our imaginations are so poverty stricken i mean i can't even li- write a um, passably good short story let alone the universe so how is it is it that we are imagining this it doesn't seem possible two questions question number 1 remember 
when we are saying that this universe is false, in relation to what? Not in relation to our day-to-day -day lives. It is false in relation to Brahman, to infinite existence consciousness bliss. Just as a dream is false in relation to our waking life. Within the dream, you don't say it's, it, it's false because everything else in the dream is as real as the dream itself. It's, the whole thing is false when you wake up. In the same way, all this, the variety of nature, science uh, and our culture and art and all this universe we see around, how real is it? It's as real as, uh, as we take it to be in our day-to-day -day lives. But what Advaita is saying is that there is a deeper reality. There is a greater reality. Greater than our what they will call a transactional reality. This is false compared to that greater reality. Just as the dream becomes false when you wake up. And this waking life is false and appearance compared to Brahman. Not within itself. So that's there, number one. Number two, no, we are not imagining it. Our little minds are not imagining it. Though our minds are much more careful, more, more powerful than we give them credit for. Remember, we generate an industrial grade reality in dreams. No virtual reality today in Hollywood can match our dreams. We have such vivid dreams. So our minds can generate a whole world for us. But even there, this world which we are seeing now, we are not generating it. Who is generating this world? According to Vedanta, Vedanta just said, God is generating this world, not us. Not us. It's Universal Studios which is generating it. <laughs> so, it is a creation of God, but Advaita Vedanta takes a step beyond that. It's beyond God and Maya is Brahman, which in reality, God is and you also are. Yes. Sorry. Just wait on for the microphone. On some level, um isn't the, the rope snake analogy, isn't that great? Because, I mean, that's one for one. Yes. It's one thing for another thing. But we're not talking about that. We're not talking about samsara, you exchange that and you get God. It's not, I mean, All right. If I let, well let, for me. <laughs> let me see what we are uh, uh, talking about here. Yes, the nature of error of what we are experiencing now, is exactly what you said. Mistaking one thing for another. In fact, Shankaracharya uses exactly this thing, this language. What is error? Uh, atasmin tad buddhi. What is not there, you see it there. A real world of multiplicity, of suffering and seeking and limitation and frustration is not out there. But we see it there because of ignorance of Brahman. When we realize Brahman, are we going to exchange one thing for another? We are going to exchange unhappiness for happiness and peace. We are going to exchange life and death for immortality. We are going to exchange limitedness for infinity. In, if you don't like the language of this is real and that is false, we are experiencing a world of falsity and we will find out the reality. Swami Vivekananda says you can think of it in this way. Going from lower truth to higher truth. We inhabit a world of lower truth. We will discover a reality which is higher truth. He pu again puts it in another way, Swami Vivekananda. He says, we do not know things as they are. And what are they in reality? As they are, in reality, it is all God. We don't, we don't see anything as God. We see a world and human us. That's all we see. And in enlightenment, we see everything as God, as existence, consciousness, place. It will be this universe itself. We will not trade in this universe to get a new one. It will be this universe, but you know it as it is. There's one more question. Yeah. Yes, there. And I'll come. Oh, okay, but we just. No, I just one sentence. Yeah. Sometimes I find it's better, better than using the word false, is to say secondary. Derived. All right. Uh, Mataji said that sometimes it's better to use the word secondary or derived rather than false. False is a word that is used by Vedanta, Mithya. But secondary or derived is also used by Vedanta. By post Shankar Advaitins, they call it 
Vyavaharika Satyam. If you don't like using the word false for this universe, another word they use in Vedanta is transactional reality or derived reality or secondary reality. Primary reality, God or Brahman. Secondary or derived reality, our world of experience. They call it, the technical term in Vedanta is Vyavaharika, transactional, empirical, relative reality. So what Vedanta is telling us is not, if, not that this is all false. This is not there. What they are telling us is you can take it to be as real as you want it to be, but there is a greater reality right here. You can, if you want to put it in those terms, yes. But as an Advaita teacher said to me, if people feel hurt, so we'll call it a secondary reality. <laughs> the, does, what does secondary reality mean? It means exactly the same thing as false. <laughs> All right. That's the last question. If what we are is something undescribable by words, yes. why do we constantly see it as like infinite or infinite happiness, or what, what is real, what is constant classification that okay. you're using? All right. So the question is, if it's something indescribable by words or you cannot express it by words, you are using plenty of words to say that. <laughs> well, I'll, in one word, I'll refer you to my lecture, Paradox of Language. Two, question, uh, two um, topics have been dealt with there. You will find it interesting. First of all, why are, do, are you saying that it is something that we cannot use words for? And there's a very clear analysis given by Shankaracharya and other Advaita teachers. Why we cannot use words for Brahman? Very clear. It shows what language is, how language operates, and why it cannot operate on Brahman. Number one. Second is, in that case, what are the scriptures doing? What is Vedanta doing? Mostly Vedanta is text, it is words. What is this other than words? So if words cannot describe it, then how are these operating? So what are these strategies? There are five strategies taken up by Vedanta to approach this problem. Vedanta does the impossible, expressing in words what cannot be expressed in language. So there are different strategies. You will see, using the word infinite, for example, is one of them. You see, well, what we're doing here is, if you cannot express it as it is, how about expressing it by denying everything else? I can't say what it is, but I can say what it is not. Right? That's one strategy. And there are other strategies also. Right, so that was a very interesting session. And we'll meet again next week, I think, uh, on, on Tuesday. Next week, yes. next week on Tuesday. And uh, it looks like we are going, there's some good news from next month onwards we'll probably have one class each week, either on Tuesdays or on Thursdays, and it'll all be put up on the, uh, on the monthly program. So instead of two classes a month, we can have three or f even four classes a month. So one class per week. We will make much better progress. And you won't forget quite as much. <laughs> Thank you very much.